Our topic for this afternoon is Nietzsche, Nietzsche's philosophy. And I will be presenting first uh, his, uh, well, we'll be dividing this lecture into two. And then after the first part, we'll have a break and then continue uh, with the discussion. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So this is Nietzsche's uh, philosophy. And just a an introduction to his uh, to his philosophy to his life. Uh, Nietzsche was a German philosopher of the late 19th century who challenged the foundation of traditional morality and Christianity. He believed in life, creativity, health, and the realities of the world we live in, rather than those situated in a world beyond. So Nietzsche is trying to affirm our life here after, affirmation of life here, hereafter, without looking beyond this world or the kind of life in the next world or in the afterlife. So that is the basic position of Nietzsche about human life. Human life is here and now, and we have to make the most of it. We have to affirm life in the here and now. Okay. Now, central to Nietzsche's philosophy is the idea of life affirmation. Similar to the idea of Kierkegaard, that we have to affirm life you know, in all its stages. Now, this life affirmation involves an honest questioning of all doctrines which drains life's energies, however socially prevalent those views might be. So we have already mentioned in the introduction of uh, existentialism that Nietzsche together with Kierkegaard question, critique, uh, the culture, the present, the, the milieu that they were in. Even if these uh, doctrines no, the, doc the doctrines that prevail in their own milieu were socially accepted. So it's like Nietzsche is trying to uh, invite people not to be drawn to all these doctrines that for him sucks life's energies. We have to affirm life hereafter and not focus not rely much on the doctrines so we have to we have to uh we, we should not be dogmatic about the whole about the whole thing we must be reflective we must be we must be critical of the doctrines that prevail in the society so he's inviting us to be critical now often referred to as one of the first existentialist philosophers Nietzsche has inspired leading figures from all walks of life, you know, including dancers, poets, writers, painters, novelists, philosophers, psychologists, sociologists, many other social revolutionaries. But of course, he was not really very popular during his time. Nobody cared about his work. It was only after his death that people recognized the importance of his ideas and his works. Nietzsche is often described to be tragic, terrifying, strident, troubled, mad, some people would say, but he was a powerful, intense writer, a very intoxicating and charismatic thinker. And one description that I would really like about Nietzsche is that he was prophetic he was prophetic prophetic in the sense that he can see what is coming although people never re realize those things that are coming and coming in the sense that what is already happening in the society in the culture that he was in we will talk about this as we go along now just a very brief a discussion on his life and his works. So he was born in a small German town of Rocken on October 15, 1844. 
the same date of the 20, 49th birthday of the Prussian King Frederick Wilhelm IV. And he was actually named after this Prussian King, Friedrich. When Nietzsche was four years old, his father, Karl Ludwig Nietzsche, died from a brain ailment. And the death of Nietzsche's two-year-old brother, Joseph, would follow six months later. After his father's death, Karl Ludwig's death, the family moved to, a, to nearby Nomborg, where Nietzsche lived for the next eight years with all women in his in his family his mother francisca his paternal grandmother Erdmoth, his father's two sisters august and rosalie and his younger sister therese elizabeth alexandra who would later take care of nietzsche when their mother died from the ages of 14 to 19 nietzsche attended a first-rate boarding school Solforta, located not far from their town, uh, Nomborg, where he prepared for university studies. Here he would meet his lifelong acquaintance, Paul Dusen. During his summers in Nomborg, Nietzsche led a small music and literature club named Germania, and he became acquainted with the music of Richard Wagner, whom he would meet later, later on. The teenage Nietzsche also read the German romantic writings of the, uh, <clears throat> of the German um, uh, writer Frederick Hollerlin and John Paul Richter. After graduating, Nietzsche entered the University of Bonn in 1864 and he took up theology and philosophy, philology, but his interest gravitated exclusively towards philology, a discipline which then centered upon the interpretation of classical and biblical texts. As a philosophy or philology student, Nietzsche attended lectures of Otto Jan and Friedrich Wilhelm Ritschall. Nietzsche quickly established his own academic reputation through his published essays on Aristotle, Theogenes, and Simonides. In 1865, Nietzsche accidentally discovered Arthur Schopenhauer's The World as Will and Representation in a Local Bookstore. So he entered this bookstore. He was looking for something, but he accidentally found this book of Arthur Schopenhauer. The story goes that he actually stayed there for quite some time reading the book. So he was then 21 years old and Schopenhauer's atheistic and turbulent vision of the world in conjunction with his highest praise of music as an art form captured the imagination of the young Nietzsche. Now, two years later, in 1867, Nietzsche entered his required military service. Uh, it's just a requirement at the time. And was assigned to an equestrian field ulteriorly close to his town number. However, he suffered a serious chest injury and returned shortly to the University of Leipzig. So his military service was rather cut short. In October, in uh, November of 1868, he finally met the composer Richard Wagner, whose music he was, you know, attracted so much. Wagner and Nietzsche shared the same enthusiasm for Schopenhauer's ideas, and Nietzsche admired Wagner for his musical genius and for his magnetic personality. In fact, Nietzsche would often be invited to the residence of Wagner during special occasions. So they, they became very close to one another. But of course, later on, they will have a falling apart. 
Nietzsche was later recommended for a position on the classical philology faculty of the University of Basel. You know, and the Swiss University offered Nietzsche a position. So he began teaching in the, at the University of Basel in May of 60, 1869 at the, at the young age of 24 years old. So Nietzsche's enthusiasm for Schopenhauer, his studies in classical philology, his inspiration from Wagner, and from his frustration with the contemporary German culture, coalesced in his first publication, The Birth of Tragedy. That's, that would be the first book of Nietzsche. Uh, it's actually a critique of contemporary German culture. However, this book, The Birth of Tragedy, did not receive a good review. And Nietzsche, of course, was expecting that this will be uh, received a very good review, but it did not happen. But Nietzsche remained respected in his professional position in Basel. Now, with his failing health, which led to migraines, hurt, uh, headaches, eyes, uh, eyesight problems, and vomiting. It necessitated that he resigned from the University of Basel in June of 1879. Okay. So, from, 19, uh, from 1888, the following year, until his collapse in January of 1889, nine years. Nietzsche led a wandering gypsy-like existence as a stateless person because he gave up his German citizenship and he did not acquire did not acquire Swiss citizenship while he was at the University of Basel. So what happened was that he was circling almost annually between his mother's house in Nuremberg, in the various cities in France, in Switzerland, in Germany, and in Italy. He was sort of a nomad, no? A nomad. Now, on a visit to Rome in 1882, he was already 37 years old at this time, he met Lou Salome a 21-year-old student, a Russian student, you know, was studying philosophy and theology in Zurich. And he soon fell in love with Lou Salome, and he actually offered his hand in marriage. However, Lou Salome declined, and the future of Nietzsche's friendship with Lou Salome suffered as a consequence. In the years to follow, Salome would become an associate of Sigmund Freud and would actually write with psychological insight of her association with Nietzsche. Now, during these nomadic years, Nietzsche wrote his main works, his most important works, in succession. Almost every year, he's producing books one after the other. In 1881, he published Daybreak. 1882, The Gay Science. From 83 to 85, he published Das Spoke Zarathustra. In 1886, he published Beyond Good and Evil. And in 1887, on the genealogy of morals. Now, for his final active year, 1888, he would publish several books in succession. Okay? So, May to August of 88, he published The Case of Wagner. And then, August to September of 1888, The Twilight of the Idols. And then September of 1888, The Antichrist. 
October to November of 1888, and finally, December of 1888, he published Nietzsche contra Wagner. And then the following year, early morning of January 3, 1889, while he was in Tur Turin, Nietzsche experienced a mental breakdown which left him an invalid for the rest of his life. Upon witnessing a horse being whipped by, by a coachman, Nietzsche threw his arms around the horse's neck and collapsed, never to return to full sanity. Um, some argue that Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche was afflicted with a syphilitic infection. Uh, this was the original uh, diagnosis of the doctors in Basel and Vienna, which he probably contracted either while he was a student or while he was serving as a hospital attendant during the franco prussian War. Some claims that Nietzsche's use of chloral hydrate, a drug which he had been using as a sedative, detox deteriorated his already wicked nervous system, while others speculate that Nietzsche's collapse was due to a brain disease he inherited from his father. And there are many other um, theories about the cause of his incapacitation, but the, the real, the exact cause of what, you know, the cause of that mental breakdown is not really clear. But that is already beside the point. The point is that before that unfortunate incident, Nietzsche was so productive, he was so prolific in writing. And of course, he never experienced uh, popularity during his, his life. Now, after a brief hospitalization in Basel, he spent 1889 in a sanatorium in Vienna at the Vince Wagner Clinic. And then in March of 1890, his mother took him back to Nuremberg, where he would live under her care for the next seven years. He was taken care of by his mother. But when his mother died in 1897, his younger sister, Elizabeth, assume responsibility for his welfare. And in an effort to promote his brother's philosophy, he rented a large house on a hill in Weimar called the Villa Silberblick. And she moved both Nietzsche and Nietzsche's collected manuscripts to that residence. And this would become the new home of Nietzsche, where Elizabeth and he uh, received visitors who wanted to, you know, visit Nietzsche the philosopher. On August 25, 1900, Nietzsche died in the villa as he approached his 56th birthday, apparently due to pneumonia in combination with a stroke. That's the life of Nietzsche. During his creative years, Nietzsche struggled to bring his writings into print and never doubted that these books would have lasting cultural effect. But he did not live long enough to experience this, you know, his world historical influence, his far reaching influence in human thought, in human knowledge. He said, I came too early. My time was not yet. Of course, there are other books that he wrote aside from the major books that I have, I have mentioned. If I'm not mistaken, one of the books that he wrote was entitled, Why Do I Write Good Books? So Nietzsche have had this, you know, uh, uh, 
kind of pride in himself of his genius. Okay, now let's go to his philosophy, Nietzsche, the philosopher. And I like the description of Nietzsche as being prophetic. He's prophetic, he's a visionary. He's not just some charismatic, intense writer. He was visionary and he was prophetic. You can see what is looming beyond the horizon. Now, let's go back to the time of Nietzsche. That's 19th century. And 19th century is filled with a sense of optimism. A sense of optimism in science, in reason, you know, in technology. So people were quite optimistic of their age. Okay. Remember, this could still be towards the end of the Enlightenment period. But Nietzsche, despite the optimism of his age, saw storm clouds looming on the horizon. And he thought that time will come when the world would find its dearest dreams shattered. That all their dreams were nothing but illusions. They were empty. So the notions of God, truth, reality, objective values, human progress, and, and so on and so forth, they would soon be exposed as empty illusions. And man would soon be engulfed by nihilism. Of course, at the time, nobody listened to Nietzsche about his talks about nihilism. For Nietzsche, what is needed in this, you know, in this looming, uh, in this storm, you know, the looming storm, what is needed is the ability to affirm life. Affirm life with open eyes without resorting to the comforts of our philosophical and theological traditions. In other words, the theological and philosophical traditions that we cling on will later be proven to be empty projections. They were just, they are just projections of the mind. So like Kierkegaard, he took it as his mission to criticize the culture, his milieu, the society he lived in, which he thought reached an unprecedented no point. Of course, people were quite optimistic, they have this positive attitude to their you know, about their time during their time. But Nietzsche was trying was saying, you will soon discover, realize that all of these are just projections of the mind. So he wrote that philosophers are like surgeons who apply the scalpel of their thoughts to the chest of the very virtues of their time to understand and excise the pathological conditions that plague humanity. So our thoughts, the philosopher's thoughts are like scalpel. We cut on our chest to reveal the pathological conditions, our pathological, the pathological conditions of our life, of our humanity. And Nietzsche would carry out this mission in a style that is rather sketchy, irritating, slippery, expressing his thoughts in aphorisms or short statements, which are meant to provoke and challenge the reader. So in this, in this approach, he was like Kierkegaard, who invite the reader to reflect, to analyze, you know, to think for himself. That's the prophetic Nietzsche. Now, let's go to the next point. Philosophy as pathology and therapy. 
Nietzsche was convinced that traditional philosophy is not simply a result of intellectual mistake, but it is also a symptomatic, a symptom of a deep-seated psychological disease which needs to be cured. Okay? Remember the analogy of the philosopher stuck as a scalpel? Cuts on our body to expose the pathological condition. Okay? So for, for Nietzsche, philosophy is not just a result of intellectual mistake, it's also a symptom of deep-seated psychological disease. Our problem, according to Nietzsche, is our lack of honesty and fear of our own subjectivity. We're afraid of ourselves. There are, we, we hide so many fears, so many insecurities. So the philosopher sees himself this traditional philosopher sees himself as one who simply mirrors reality in his thoughts while deluding himself that he has stamped out any trace of his own personal commitments in his seeming objective analysis. Because the philosopher, the traditional philosopher, according to Nietzsche, its, a, its purpose is to analyze reality objectively and come up with his own objective analysis hoping that his analysis is will be he can distance himself from his own analysis of reality according to nietzsche that is not the case because we the, the philosopher actually uh projects his own thoughts, projects his own fears, his own idols, so to speak. So this is coming from beyond good and evil. He writes, what provokes one to look at all philosophers half suspiciously, half mockingly? It's not that one discovers again and again how innocent they are or how often and how easily they make mistakes and go astray. In short, their childishness and childlikeness. But that they are not honest enough in their work. This is an indictment of the philosopher. Although they make a lot of virtuous, virtuous noise, when the problem of truthfulness is touched, even remotely. In other words, when they hear about truth, then they chatter. They make noise. They all pose as if they had discovered in which their real opinions through the self-development code, pure, divinely unconcerned dialectic, as opposed to the mystics of every rank who are more honest in Daltis, and talk of inspiration, while at the bottom it is an assumption, meaning the philosophers are just making assumptions, a hunch, indeed a kind of inspiration, most often a desire of the heart that has been filtered and made abstract, that they defend with reasons they have sought after the fact. They are all advocates who but they are all advocates who uh, <clears throat> resent that name and for the most part even while a spokesperson for their prejudices which they baptized as truth so the projection the prejudices of the philosophers became the truth for the philosophers and very far from having the courage of the conscience that admits this Precisely this itself, very far from having the good taste of the courage, which also lets this be known, whether to man, to one, or an enemy or friend, or from exuberance to mock itself. So that is some sort of an indictment of 
philosophers. It's a critique. It's a criticism of the philosophers. Now Nietzsche said, but every philosophy is a personal confession of his author, a kind of involuntary and unconscious memoir. So every philosophy of a person is a personal confession of the philosopher himself, a memoir. And then he continues, gradually it has become clear that what ev that every great philosophy so far has been, namely the personal confession of its author, in a kind of involuntary and unconscious memoir, also that the moral or immoral intentions in every philosophy constituted the real germ of life from which the whole plant had grown. So, this leaves us with philosophy that says all our deepest truths are fictions. They are all just projections. They are just products of our imaginations. And the philosopher hails this as the ideals. But they are just illusions. They are subjective projections of the philosopher. Now, the question is, with this condition, should we despair about philosophy, about human thought, about culture? The answer of Nietzsche is no. Despair is not an option. Yes, despair is inevitable. It's not inevitable, but it's not a choice. No? Meaning, it's, you know, meaning it's, it's, it is us who will make the choice whether we will succumb to this condition or not. But for Nietzsche, it's, it's not really, there, you really don't have much of a choice. You, you have to embrace this. But he's telling us, yes, we have the option. It's our choice that we make. But we need to hang on in a firm life. It's like Sisyphus pushing the the rock. Okay, it, it, well, Sisyphus will have an option whether to continue pushing or just stop. But for Nietzsche, there's the, the only way to go is to push harder. Okay, but well, people will no longer push. But the better option is to push, to continue living the firm life. Because for Nietzsche, the meaning of our condition will have no meaning until we decide what meaning we will give to that condition. So for Nietzsche, what is now needed is a new type of spirit, a new attitude, a new orientation. A new breed of philosophers, of thinkers, that will allow us to face this nihilistic, pessimistic picture and triumph over it. So the hope for philosophy for Nietzsche and for Western civilization is a new breed of philosophers, new individuals, what he would call the free spirits who will no longer rest on the comforts of the illusion based on a metaphysics that has already been dismissed and will not think of values and truths are out there in the world waiting to be plucked. You know, this new breed of individuals with a new attitude, new orientation, new breed of philosophers, this will be individuals who will have the ego strength to realize that they must create their own truth and values, must create their own meaning in their lives. Let's go to the next point, empty metaphysics. Here, he was referring to 
the traditional metaphysics. The metaphysics that considers the idea of God, the idea of objective truth, the idea of a supernatural life, the idea of objective values, and so on and so forth. But according to Nietzsche, all we have now are illusions. They are just projections. These are just projections of the philosophers or of the thinkers of the past. So what we need to do now, according to Nietzsche, is to abandon all hopes for this rational metaphysics of knowledge of the truth. The metaphysics of the world that lies beyond the world of appearances. Because this world beyond the world of appearances, or the world or the realm beyond this realm, it's but a projection of the philosophers. So for Nietzsche, this kind of metaphysics is a product of human weakness. This metaphysics arose from the need for certainty or something outside of us that we can lean on. You know, it's not just Nietzsche who have this idea of rejecting a world or dimension beyond this world. I have fever back. Marx. For them, that thought of God or that kind of metaphysics that we construct in order that, that we will have some security blanket. So we think of God because, you know, in our weakness, he will save us. According to Nietzsche, these are just empty illusions. So we cannot lean on something that is outside of this existence. We have to cling on to this. There's no need of projecting ourselves or thinking about, about some outside, you know, beyond this temporal world. That is a sign of weakness. And because we are weak, we project, project something, project the idea of a God who will save us. Who will reward us so it's a kind of security blanket a psychological net but these are all just projections of the mind according to Nietzsche so the picture of the world as a source of our comforts a comfortable home that sustains our intellectual moral and spiritual quests have long been questioned they have been undermined the values that we have been giving meaning, that have been giving meaning to our lives, they are all God. So humanity is left desolate and abandoned. We are all left homeless. We are like wanderers who must resign to spiritual nomadism. So this kind of metaphysics that man cling on is actually an empty metaphysics. Now, part of that metaphysics is the idea of God. And if that metaphysics is gone, then the idea of God is also gone. From the demise of metaphysics, what comes next is the demise of God, the death of God. Because God is part of that metaphysics. Now, because there is no longer an absolute and objective standard of truth and value, all everything has been undermined as a kind of illusion and interpretations, then it, what follows is that there are no objective sources of truth and values, no more. 
although according to Nietzsche, we still have a lingering after image of theism that still produce our most persistent illusions. But according to Nietzsche, there's now a growing realization that this ideology is dead, it's gone. But of course, for Nietzsche, he's not saying that for some time, there was this powerful eternal being who existed and then they died. What he's trying to describe here is a kind of psychological and cultural event that is making itself evident. But what caused this demise of metaphysics? And what caused this eventual demise of God? What caused this death of God? According to Nietzsche, what actually caused this demise of God is the age of science and technology that undermines the place of God in people's lives. While, people's, while people have this projection of God, this illusion of God, they were actually putting their faith on scientific and technological progress. We are actually moving toward an age of secularism. Yes, people still have this idea of God. They still, they, they still entertain this image of God. But in reality, according to Nietzsche, the, the time is moving towards secularism. Its people are no longer, they no longer need to find the notion of God relevant. Because everything can be provided by technology, by science. So there's no need for the God. Of course, not everyone thought or realizes the situation. Only very few who are detached from their cultural condition can see this coming. Those who are waiting on the mountains, according to Nietzsche can see this cultural crisis coming in the distance, this circularism thing that eventually people will lose you know, their belief in God. God will eventually be irrelevant to them. So in each account, the belief in God arose because we are unable to have faith in ourselves. And so we need a projects to project something out there which we can cling on. But once we realize the reason for this belief, then religious belief will no longer be credible because man will now cling to something else. It will now cling to the promise of science and technology. Nietzsche had these anti-religious sentiments. We are very religious, but you cling to this God you will soon found out, find out that your, the God that you cling on, the cling on is no longer relevant because you will cling on to something else. How should we understand the atheism of Nietzsche? Despite these anti-religious sentiments of Nietzsche, despite his atheism, his unbelief in this God that people cling on, he recognizes that there are people in history who are religious and that religion had some beneficial effects. And to a certain extent, this shows the ambivalence you know, of Nietzsche when it comes to Christ, for example, his attitude towards Christ. Because although Nietzsche despised the Sermon of the Mount because he considered that as a kind of, as a sign of weakness, Nietzsche actually admires Jesus' personal power. He said Jesus offered us a model of the inner directed person. He did not give us a set of doctrines or he did not advocate personal redemption. He said Jesus did not live to redeem men, but to show how one must live. 
So Nietzsche distinguished between what is admirable in Jesus and the doctrines and morality that the Christians have piled on top of him. And for this reason, he says, in truth, there was only one Christian and he died on the cross. So Christ is motivated by inner power, inner strength, while the Christians were motivated by weakness. Now, Nietzsche's atheism, his account of the death of God, was developed as a reaction to the conception of this ultimate single judgmental authority who is private to our hidden and personally embarrassing secrets. That's one thing that he does not like. Such atheism is also aimed to redirect people's attention to their inherent freedom, to the presently existing world, and away from all ace escapist, pain relieving, heavenly other words or afterlife. We have to live our life here. So he denies this personal God and this notion of life in the afterlife. We have to focus here. But you see, there's another dimension in the atheism of Nietzsche. Because although Nietzsche denies this kind of God, his belief in this, you know, single God who can, you know, uh, see our thoughts. He said, especially in the Das of Zarathustra, when he declared God is dead, God is dead. We killed him. We, we killed God. In other words, Nietzsche was just announcing the death of God. But who caused the death of God? People. You. Us. We killed him. Because of our life. Because although we say we believe in this God, we believe in Jesus, for example, but we never live the life that Jesus showed us. Okay. So that's this critique of religion and of God, of Nietzsche. Now, it's a kind of critique of Nietzsche's take on God's existence and his take against Christianity. Because he was very particular with his critique of religion. He's critiquing Christianity. Uh, <clears throat> I think perhaps what he saw during his time of Christianity is not really the real Christianity taught by Jesus. I mean, the same with Kierkegaard, who was critical of the of the church during his time. Nietzsche saw the hypocritic Christians. And he thought that all Christians are like that. Because that's the kind of Christians that he encountered. Had he encountered the Christian who's like Jesus, maybe he will not write of Christianity that way. Maybe, maybe he will not think of Christianity as motivated by witness. Because when you listen, for example, to the Mount, to the Sermon of the Mount, 
blessed are the poor in spirit they will inherit the kingdom of God it's not really glorifying poverty of spirit <laughs> and if a Christian follows or subscribes to that teaching it does not mean witness it doesn't mean a kind of herd mentality because the Christian can actually accept that teaching and affirm life here on earth this real Christianity what real Christianity teaches that yes we anticipate we project our lives to the eternal life but it doesn't mean that we abandon our life here we still have to live our life to the fullest here now it is those Christians who because they desire to help, uh, obtain eternal life they just focus on that life and neglect their life here that's what Nietzsche probably see as a kind of witness okay. anyway let's go to nihilism and the will to power because so uh, this is leading towards the ubermens now so the death of god leads to nihilism without god no objective sources of values no moral social and political values if there are they are just projections or interpretations and most people realize that religious beliefs are empty and that progress through science does not offer any meaning or purpose at all so it's like man projected god but abandoned god altogether and cling onto science and the promise of science but science will no longer be able to offer any meaning at all so what do we have a sense of emptiness a sense of nihilism everything will amount to nothing no supernatural order no god no values the divinely and rationally ordained goal god without god we are left to ourselves that's what he called perfect nihilism and out of this condition however a counter movement finds expression a movement that in some future will take the place of this perfect nihilism and this will come only after and out of this perfect nihilism and therefore the advent of nihilism is necessary because it made us realize what kind of values we really had out of nihilism we realize our values and this is an opportunity to choose and create our values which for a long time values according to Nietzsche have been just forced on us based on this kind of metaphysics so while the death of God and the consequent nihilism may signal a calamity for the weak it will bring opportunity for the strong It will be an opportunity for the strong all our activities manifest a drive to achieve mastery and to exert personal power over our environment over our condition and this principle is the will of power so out of the nihilism <laughs> will emerge this drive to achieve mastery of ourselves thank you to achieve mastery over our, over our condition this is the will to power this is the fundamental psychological force in human life so the fundamental drive motivating all things in the universe is the will to power the will to master oneself So this will to power, which Nietzsche refers to as instinct for freedom, is the drive for autonomy from and dominance over all other wills. 
this will to power can be found in the unrefined expression in the rape and pillage and torture of primitive barbarians. But it can also be refined. It can also be refined into a kind of cruelty against oneself, struggling to make oneself deeper, stronger, and achieving an independent mind. This is the instinct for freedom. The, the will to power to be, to actualize oneself. So this will to power lurks behind the meaning creating activities of different sorts of people. You can find this will to power. You can find this in the saint who disciplines his body and mind through the rigors of fasting and meditation in order to achieve an ecstatic experience. It can also be found in the artist who struggles against criticism to impose his vision on the world in the canvas. Or it can also be uh, seen in the lover who risks rejections and face difficulties to win the affection of the person that he loves. Or it can find expression in the student who strives in his studies to achieve his ambition. Or you can see this in the athletes who tortures himself in training just to attain the victory that he desires. All of these are manifestations of the will to power. Now, related to this is the idea of eternal recurrence. What is this eternal recurrence? One, one interpretation is that eternal recurrence is the idea that at some point you are going to return to your original position. Okay, but the more important interpretation of that eternal recurrence is the recognition that everything is connected and nothing is permanent. And that if one says yes to one thing in the universe, one must necessarily say yes to everything. In other words, consider this life as eternally recurring. That means there is no way out in this situation. It keeps on coming back. But the coming back is not important. What is important is that you cannot escape this world. So the ideal person for Nietzsche is one who has the strength and the courage to affirm this life. Not to think of escape out of this life. To live this life to the fullest. To affirm life to the fullest. Do not be mediocre. Do not think of, well, it's okay if I don't do, do good here anyway. I will, when I die, I will have a better place. That is an escapist attitude according to Nietzsche. So Nietzsche's doctrine of eternal recurrence is also formulated to draw attention away from the all worlds other than this one in which we presently live. So the eternal occurrence precludes the possibility of any final escape from this present world. And therefore we have to live, affirm this life. Because for Nietzsche, this is the only life that we have. Do not think of traditional philosophy as the, the philosophy as the only love of wisdom. That when you try to critique this traditional philosophy, and therefore you don't love philosophy anymore. In fact, when you critique philosophy, you show all the more your love for wisdom. Be open to the to philosophy itself. I mean, yes, for example, yes, I understand and I love traditional philosophy. I, I I subscribe to the philosophy 
to, to Christian philosophy, it, but it does not mean that I close my eyes to the other, to other philosophies. If I have to defend Christianity against Nietzsche's critique, I already hinted this in my discussion, that perhaps the kind of Christianity that Nietzsche saw in the Christians that he encountered during his time were not real Christians. If you are familiar with, with Je the teachings of Jesus, the Gospels, the Gospel in the Gospel, if Nietzsche is critical of these hypocritic Christians, Jesus was also critical of the hypocritic Jews, the Pharisees, and the scribes. Because they were projecting that they believe in this God, they follow the law, but in fact, they don't really believe and follow the law of God. Jesus was often criticized for doing miracles during Sabbath day because he was healing, was performing miracles on Sabbath day, when in fact, everybody should rest. So that's the law. What's the answer of Jesus? The command of God is to love people, to save people. And there's no time, no day, for expressing this love for people, Sabbath included. But the Pharisees objected to this because they said, you should not perform miracles on Sabbath day because that means you should not do good things during Sabbath day. The teaching the law of God is to do good every time, every moment. So Jesus was critical of these hypocrites. And Nietzsche is also critical of those hypocrites. And for me, unfortunately, what he encountered was these hypocrite Christians. The same Christians that Kierkegaard encountered in his church. So if I may say, if the Christians will be like Jesus himself, they will be admired by Nietzsche because he admires Jesus for his inner strength. Is forgiving your, your enemies a kind of weakness? When you forgive, is it a sign of weakness? When you show humility, is it a sign of weakness? It takes more courage to be humble. It takes more courage to forgive and you will need self mastery to be able to be humble and to forgive now if you connect that to the self mastery the will to power that Nietzsche is talking about then we can be Nietzschean the will to power is not to overpower people it's not to overpower others the will to power is to overcome yourself not others and it will take lots of courage lot of self mastery to do sacrifice so this is now about uh, master and slave morality. In the book, uh, Das spoke Zarathustra, Nietzsche, through the character of Zarathustra, uh, established that the central struggle in human life, even in cosmic life, was between two absolutely distinct principles, between good and evil, which Nietzsche interpreted in Christian and humanist terms as the opposition between Selfless, uh, selflessness and benevolence on the one hand, and egoism and self-interest on the other. Uh, Zarathustra asked much more broadly about the whole new way of thinking about or imagining ourselves that he believes is necessary for this sort of reorientation. Meaning, he's talking of uh, reorienting or reinventing our values. So, according to Nietzsche, all morality is a manifestation of this will to power that we talk about. However, this will to power can manifest itself through two kinds of temperaments. One is driven by the will to power and it enjoys it, it takes it. The other one is driven by the will to power, but attempts to deny or ignore it. 
Now, these are the master morality and the slave morality. So the master morality is driven by the will to power. While the slave morality is driven by the will to power, but tries to deny this will to power. Historically, they develop out of the literal master-slave uh, relationships, like for example, in the Egyptians uh, against the Jew relationship, or uh, between the Romans and the early Christians, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, actually taken from these uh, historical relationships of peoples. But despite these historical origins, the master and slave represents two ideal types of personalities. Now, according to Nietzsche, the term master morality refers to the values of psychologically powerful and strong-willed people. There are those who are noble, elite segment of humanity. They are described so because their abilities as creative achievers in their own respective fields. So the noble types are characterized by their spontaneous overflowing of power. They determine their own values and they are never at the mercy of, their, of the approval of others. Instead of resting comfortably on social conventions, uh, and the, the authority of the others, they are confident in bringing their own values. So they are the ones who can create, who can, you know, discover their own values. The good for the masters refer to anything that leads to self-fulfillment and actualization and the affirmation of one's abilities and capacities. The identity, uh, they identify the good with nobility, strength, courage, power, pride, and other similar values. The bad for them is anything that restricts their growth, their development, or anything that is associated with weakness. And they also identify the bad with the common, banal, pathetic, cowardly, timid, humble, and so on and so forth. So this is the morality of the aristocratic, the noble caste. Okay? They celebrate themselves as the good. Now, the strength of the master does not primarily refer to physical strength. To be a master means, first and foremost, to exercise power over oneself, meaning to master oneself. So it's not about overpowering other people, okay? It's not about dominating other people. It's about dominating oneself, mastering oneself. And this power is exemplified in self-discipline, like the one that we have mentioned, the artist, the athlete, the musician, the lover, and so on and so forth. This master morality is... Uh, manifested in the free spirit this is the uh, temperament of what Nietzsche calls the free spirit so what is the free spirit he is someone who has the flexibility of mind and he's someone who is not caught up in any one particular point of view or dogma he does not subscribe to any particular dogma instead he looks at the world from different perspectives. He tries to uncover the prejudices and assumptions that underlie any particular point of view. Uh, philosophers normally build up complex system of thought to justify their own assumptions and prejudices. And the free spirit tries to dig this up. And the free spirit can see what these philosophers value most deeply and therefore they gain insight into their character so Nietzsche tries to contrast the free spirit from dogmatism of the dogmatists the free spirit is not caught up in a kind of dogmatism 
is not caught up in this particular perspective. And Nietzsche hopes that the future philosophers, this new breed of philosophers, this new breed of individuals that we mentioned a while back, would be characterized, would be like these three spirits. Okay? They're willing to try out any hypothesis and follow a position from uh, try to analyze a particular position from different perspectives. Meaning the free spirit is one who can evaluate, one who has the flexibility of the mind, one who can look at the world from different perspectives. So he's not the one who will simply follow what other people would say. He will not just follow a particular doctrine or dogma without understanding really what is in there All right now the second temperament is of course the slave morality which is of course the opposite of the mass morality according to nietzsche this is the morality of the downtrodden those who are uncertain of themselves they are uncertain of their abilities and they have weak wills it is the morality of those who lack the power to be creative to be assertive and they don't have a strong values on their, of their own. Their values arise out of fearful and resentful reaction to the values of the strong. And since the weak lack the power of the noble, they regard the strength of the strong as vices, as evil. So this the slave referred to the good uh, and identifies the identify the good with anything that makes life easy safe uh just justifies weakness the qualities of uh they they admire the qualities like patience humility pity charity abstinence modesty compassion these are considered to be virtues the morality of the slave is the morality of the poor, the sick, the unhappy, the oppressed. No? And they see life as something that is bad, wrong, identify the masters as evil. Now, this slave morality is manifested in the herd. And Nietzsche used this term herd uh, to refer to what is common, what is mediocre. He sees the herd uh, as like the animals who just, you know, follow everything. They like any individual will. They are living based on group instincts and so on and so forth. So according to Nietzsche, this herd morality uh, <clears throat> will render everyone equal in mediocrity. So he speaks out strongly against this morality of the herd that encourages dull mediocrity. He finds a mediocrity in modern scholarship, which is overly concerned with digging up what he refers to as dry, dull facts. So Nietzsche's ideal philosopher creates meaning and values, one who does not simply deal with empty facts. And his ideal philosopher, of course, would be the free spirit but according to Nietzsche behind this gentle and humble facade of the weak lies that inner desire for power of the weak hence the notion that the meek shall inherit the earth and you know it will uh, it will uh, be the kingdom I it will earn the kingdom and so on and so forth okay. so that's how Nietzsche uh, distinguish between the slave and the herd morality. And of course, he identifies the herd or the slave morality with the morality of, Christ, of the Christians because the vert virtues that he mentioned were actually Christian virtues. But of course, it's a different story if indeed, as I have already mentioned, if indeed, the virtues, the virtues of patience, humility, honesty, charity, modesty are in fact weak 
virtues. Because as I've said, it will take more courage to be humble. It will take more courage to be patient, to be modest, to be compassionate. Because the natural instinct is always to dominate. Okay. Now, let's go to the Ubermens. Because this will now be sort of a culmination of what we've been talking so you have, first of all, the critique of Nietzsche of the present era, is the present society or the present milieu. Okay, and he he regarded metaphysics, the traditional metaphysics, as empty, ushering in a kind of nihilism. And then out of this nihilism, there will be the, uber, the, the will to power. And the will to power will be manifested in the master, in the free spirits. And finally, you know, finally coming together in the ubermits. So the demise of the objective internal source of our values has resulted into a kind of crisis of values. And since our values are simply rooted in our own system, it seems that there is no values worth embracing. It seems that we are brought into a kind of a beast of nihilism. But Nietzsche insists that on the contrary, it has actually led us into a threshold of a new form of human existence which would involve a revaluation of values. A revaluation of values. Of course, this doesn't mean that we're going to invent new set of values. It simply means that we have to affirm the values that express our humanity. The values that would express our humanity. And of course, the values that express our humanity would be the one that will, you know, uh, express our will to power. It will express our self-mastery. So for Nietzsche, the categories of good and evil are actually categories of the weak. They represent the illusion that there is an objective basis or facts, moral facts in the world, by which we can determine whether something is right or wrong, or good or bad. So he said, we need to overcome that. We need to go beyond this category of good and evil. Going beyond good and evil. Because good and evil is a category of the weak. So the term is derived from Das Zarathustra, in which Nietzsche proclaims the Ubermens as the end goal of humanity. The Ubermens is someone who has, the, who has refined his will to power that he was freed, he has freed himself from all outside influences and created or affirmed his own values. So Nietzsche refers to the higher mode of being as ubermens and associates this doctrine with eternal recurrence meaning the ubermens will embrace eternal recurrence. He will affirm, he will have a universal affirmation of this life. He will accept this life and life, live a life of excellence instead of dull mediocrity. So it's only the healthiest, the ubermens, who can love his life here in its entirety. So, in relation, you know, so this will be this. You will be able to overcome, you know, uh, this all too human. He will be able to 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 overcome his all too hum the all too human aspects of his personality. Okay. So Nietzsche summarizes his ideal humanity in the image of the Ubermensch, the individual who will be the fulfillment of all the unfulfilled potential of humanity. 
because for Nietzsche, in traditional philosophy, metaphysics, with the slave morality, we will, man will never be able to fulfill his potential. So, the dismissal of metaphysics, the death of God, the dismissal of the universal objective values, the death of God provides a glorious opportunity to be strong, to be fearless, and to emerge from the herd, from the common, and to become our movements. And the overmens should be the goal of everyone. But again, what is this overmens? The overmens is not someone who will conquer other people. The overmens is not someone who will overpower, dominate other people. But rather, the overmens is someone who will overcome himself, who will master himself. He will master the destructive desires within him. His all too human passion and fears. The Ubermens will be one who has mastered his passion, overcome his fears, and affirmed his individual self. In such ideal, there will be a perfect union of spiritual energy with well being and an excess of his strength. He will combine the Roman Caesar and Christ's soul. It will be a perfect combination of passion and reason, a harmony of the Dionysian and the Apollonian spirit. So the Ubermens for Nietzsche will abolish the false idols of conventional morality or traditional morality and replace it with the morality of the strong or the morality of the free spirit. Now, just a side just a side discussion here about passion and reason, because if we go back to the first book of Nietzsche, The Birth of Tragedy, according to Nietzsche, there are non rational forces that reside in the foundation of all creativity and of reality itself. A strong, uh, strongly instinctual, while a moral Dionysian energy. This is the will. This, this, this raw, no, this instinctual will, energy, within the pre-Socratic Greek culture. But this Dionysian spirit is actually creative and a healthy force. The will is a healthy force, and I think many, some other philosophers talk about the drive, the drunk, no, the geist, the will. The Ilan Vital, that, that's something primitive, that's something that is uh, instinctual. However, according to Nietzsche, in the history of Western culture, since the time of the Greeks, this Dionysian creative energy has been submerged and weakened as it became overshadowed by the Apollonian forces of logical order and stiff sobriety, of reason. So, Apollonian spirit is represented in reason. The Dionysian spirit is represented in the will. He concluded that the European culture, since the time of Socrates, until his time, had remained one-sidedly Apollonian. And because of this, it has become relatively unhealthy. So as a means towards cultural rebirth, Nietzsche advocated the resurrection and fuller release of the Dionysian creative artistic energies, those that are associated with primordial creativity, joy in existence, and the ultimate truth. So, to a certain degree, Nietzsche favors the Dionysian spirit, the will, the passion, over reason because reason has been logic has been so stiff so formal that it has weakened the creative spirit within 
man, the Dionysian spirit within man. So, in the in the Ubermens, there will be a combination of the Dionysian spirit and the Apollonian spirit. Combination of inner strength and of course uh, the inner strength and the outward no, strength. Now, what follows here are some, I would call, apparatus or mechanisms of acquiring or becoming the Ubermens. The first one is sublimation. Sublimation is the act of repressing one's immediate instincts for power in order to achieve a more refined expression of power. So you sublimate, for example, your inner desires, something, sublimate, because you want to attain a more refined expression of power. So for example, you resist the temptation to assault others. Instead, I can turn that instinct of cruelty inward upon myself you know, so that I make my mind and my will strong. The second is of self-overcoming. According to Nietzsche, we are both creator and a creature. We are both the animal with its instincts for cruelty and aggression, and the overmans with his self-made will and set of values. And in order to overcome or to become more noble, to approximate the overmans, we must turn our animal instincts for cruelty against the creature in us. So in a painful process of self-examination and you know inner struggle, we must make ourselves deeper and stronger. So he calls this self-overcome is a kind of self-punishment. There is an order of rank according to which the spiritual strength of people can be measured. Nietzsche suggests that the strongest people are marked by a cruelty to themselves, according to which they mercilessly expose their very prejudice and assumption in order to dig more deeply into themselves. So pretty much like if uh, you are training for something, you know, if you want to achieve something, what do you do? You sacrifice, you punish yourself in order to achieve more. Those who want it easy, they never reach their destination, their dreams. But if you're going to sacrifice, punish yourself during the night and read and finish your papers, you'll achieve something. But if you want to take it easy, 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 just, you know, Wasting your time with playing games and games and games and games. You all want comfort, then you will achieve nothing. Last point. Nietzschean truth and good. And this one is connected to Nietzsche's notion of perspectivism. An understanding of Nietzsche's work as a whole relies on a solid grasp of his views on truth and language and his metaphysics and conception of the will to power. At the very bottom of Nietzsche's philosophy lies the conviction that the universe is in a constant state of change and his hatred and disparagement of almost any position can be traced back to that position's temptation to look at the universe as a fixed in one place that everything is fixed everything is permanent but according to Nietzsche the universe is in a constant state of change now Nietzsche is skeptical of both language and truth because they are liable to adopt a fixed perspective towards things once you put it in language, it becomes fixed, it becomes permanent. <clears throat> what we call truth 
is only a mobile army of metaphors, metonyms, and anthropomorphisms. So his view of this is that arbitrariness completely prevails within human experience. Concepts originate via the very artistic transference of nervous stimuli into images. And truth is nothing more than the invention of fixed conventions for merely practical purposes, especially those of repose, security, and consistency. So words, unlike thoughts, are fixed. Once you put it in writing, it becomes fixed. Once you utter it, it becomes fixed. Thoughts, our thoughts are not. Our thoughts can flow and change just as things in themselves in the universe flow and change. But a word, once you have uttered it, it cannot be changed. Because language has this tendency towards fixity, it expresses the world in terms of facts, things, which has led philosophers to think of the world as a fixed, as a something fixed, rather than fluid. Rather than consider the world as flexible, malleable. The world of rigid facts can be spoken about definitively, of course, which, of course, is the source of conception of truth and other absolutes like God and morality. Nietzsche, however, sees the facts and things of traditional philosophy as far from rigid and subject to all sorts of shifts and changes. He's particularly brilliant in analyzing morality, showing the concept of good, for instance, and has the opposite meanings at different times. So underlying the underlying forces, or the underlying force driving all chains is will. Will is the driving force of everything that chains. And according to Nietzsche, this in specific all drives boils down to a will to power. A drive for freedom and domination over other things. Now, the concept of good has many different meanings over time because different wills have come to appropriate the concept of good. And therefore, meaning and interpretation are merely signs that the will is operating in a particular concept. So because facts and things depend for their meaning on ever-shifting and struggling wills, there is no such thing as one correct perspective or one absolute viewpoint. Its viewpoint is the expression of some will or another will. So rather than try to talk about that truth, we should try to remain as flexible as possible, looking at matters from as many different perspectives as possible. So this is Nietzsche's notion of perspectivism. So Nietzsche's ideal philosophy of the future is one that is free enough to shift perspectives and overturn the truths and other dogmas of rigid thinking. And such philosophy would see moral concepts such as good and evil as merely surfaces that have no inherent meaning. And such philosophy would thus move beyond good and evil. So Nietzsche's ideal philosophers the new breed of philosophers, the free spirits, would also turn their will to power inward, struggling constantly against themselves to overcome their own prejudices and assumptions. Now, what follows here are some Nietzschean concepts that I have sort of a summary, will to power, sublimation, eternal recurrence, 
perspectivism, slave and master morality, herd and free spirits of overcoming, ubermens, nihilism. It's a kind of a summary of the main concepts of Nietzsche. Uh, 